rate adaptive pacing using CLS experiences in clinical practice and trying to keep this, again, a few disclosures, inf broad informational um, session, of course. What is CLS? So this is rate adaptive pacing algorithms using a contractility based sensor. So we have a pacemaker. How fast should it pace you? You know, it's, it's, it's up to the device. So we have ways to um, gauge how fast it should, it should pace you based on different sensors, different approximations of your activity levels or what the pacemaker thinks you might want. Here we have an algorithm which is deriving that rate from your heart's contractility, which is truly unique. It's not you moving, it's not you breathing, it's your heart contracting and changes in your heart contraction based on circulating catechols, which can be elevated or depressed for a large variety of reasons, but probably what represents the tightest physiologic um, control or representation of what your heart rate um, actually should be. So it's unique in that regard. Pacemakers went from very primitive where we were treating dangerous bradycardia that allowed us to keep people alive to then having these features that could kind of speed you up, slow you down, which made you behave a little bit more like a normal person. But how do we go from that sort of primitive technology to something that's very sophisticated and tailored to really provide an individual with the heart rate that is uh, most appropriate for them. So the goal here is to reproduce the physiologic heart rate that is, um, is best for that individual. And 2016 is an exciting year because CLS has made its way from only the pacemakers into the dual chamber ICDs and also into the CRT devices. So now across the entire Biotronic platform we have CLS and we didn't have that even last year and that was frustrating. So we have benefited, in our, we have appreciated it in our pacemaker population and now it's available to everybody and um, that's an exciting opportunity truly. So the dual chamber MRI pacemaker, the single chamber MRI pacemaker, interestingly the Biotronic single chamber MRI pacemaker was the first FDA approved single chamber device. As you recall the Medtronic device has to have two leads for MRI labeling. So Biotronic got there first which is, which is curious. And then as I said in the CRTP, dual chamber ICDs and also in the CRTD system. One limitation in the CRT is that you have to have an LV offset of zero for the CLS to be enabled. And I would say in my BIV patients, I want a CL, uh, LV offset other than zero, you know, maybe half of the time. Um, so I'm hoping at some point we have it for um, a variety of programmable LV offsets, but it still um, represents a lot of progress over, over one year ago. So best uses of CLS chronotropic incompetence. The person is not picking their appropriate heart rate. You know, someone in heart block, their atria is going at the appropriate rate. They don't necessarily need the CLS algorithm. They don't need any kind of rate sensing algorithm. For, but for that person whose body is not picking the appropriate rate, um, we can achieve physiologic heart rate variability with, with CLS. And the other interesting result is in the setting of neuro neurocardiogenic syncope. This pacemaker has um, a very unique algorithm that can address that problem, probably most effectively. So it's this upstream anticipation of what will be a reflex bradycardia. And our most recent implant for this was yesterday at 3 p.m. when someone came into the ER who had a clear history of vasovagal vaso 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 syncope, was over from Everett and at a convention in Yakima, passed out at the convention, profoundly bradycardic, hypotensive, got all the notes from UW, long history of chronotrope, of, of um, vasovagal events and faints, and it's like, finally, this is dangerous for you, and I think we have the right solution for you. And um, so he got a pacemaker, and I do think it's going to do very well for him. So additional benefits of CLS, potentially beyond providing an appropriate heart rate, that is reducing the incidence of atrial fibrillation. So you think if your atrial rate is appropriate the rest of the time, perhaps your susceptibility to atrial fibrillation will be less, and there's some evidence for that, so that's helpful. And even if your heart rates are appropriate, there can be improvements in your LV ejection fraction if that is depressed for the appropriate reasons. So potentially some other benefits um, surrounding CLS. So we talked first of all about um, sensors for rate, adapt rate adaptive pacing. What sensors are available? There are accelerometers, 
and advantages to accelerometers is they can have a fast reaction to exercise so you start to move and the pacemaker speeds you up so that's nice it can be somewhat proportional to your workload um, problems are it can be fooled by certain motions which aren't you in fact exercising and then there is no non-exercise sensitivity so a lot of heart rate variability where you're not in fact moving that is physiologic and appropriate that we'd like the pacemaker to be able to reproduce and of course the accelerometers can't do that Minute ventilation is another sensor that is indeed physiologic. Um, pro is that it requires, um, that it, the pro is that it is physiologic. In point of fact, it requires hard breathing. And in, as in reality, we can do a fair amount of exertion and activity where we would have swings in our heart rate of 5, 10, um, 15, 20 beats per minute where we're not breathing faster. So it's not sensitive to those things and it's not going to be able to help people with that sort of physiology and there's a delay from the onset of exertion to when you start to huff and puff and um, so the minute ventilation can take a while to kick in. Blended sensors using both the accelerometer and minute ventilation are of course better. Are they good enough is the question. And then we have CLS, contractility based. Subtle changes in physiology are reflected in contractility which changes pacing rate. Um, motion and breathing are not required. So those are the potential pros. How does this work? Again, blended sensors, if you have an accelerometer-based pacing system and a minute ventilation-based pacing system, as you move from being at rest into your activities of daily life to heavy exercise, um, the accelerometer performs well with that transition, doesn't always do well as you really start to increase heavily. The minute ventilation won't do well early as you transition from rest. And the gap that we tend to get, even with blended sensors, is surrounding your activities of daily living. As we move around, as we have different ch changes in our emotional state, um, sort of normal behavior where heart rate fluctuations are possible and appropriate, um, the sensors don't serve us well. And this is the potential um, niche for the um, CLS algorithm to fill. So I put this up here, I added this from my last talk over the break. Classic sensor-based rate histogram. How many times have you seen this? Where somebody is parked at their lower rate limit the vast majority of the time, and then with DDDR programming, they will get some increases in their rate, but it sort of looks like this. It's obviously very proportional to the sensor, and um, that's how they get to speed up. What activity allows them to do that is uncertain, but definitely most of their time at the lower rate limit when they are in fact animated people who are real and would probably enjoy some heart rate variability. And that's classic. And we can adjust the sensors and we've all done that, tried to make them steeper and more sensitive and more sensitive. And all of a sudden you, pr you push someone into something where they have another secondary spike, which is clearly non-physiologic and they come back because they can't stand that. So we put it all back and we haven't made any progress. And we've all been in that scenario in our device clinics and frustrated by that. And when I see that happening now, I'm starting to think there's a real opportunity for CLS in this individual, you know, at the time of their next generator change. And we've seen that historically, I think, mostly in our, in our pacer-dependent ICD patients. You know, and until this year, we didn't have CLS as an option. But now that we do, it becomes a real possibility for these sorts of people. And I think that's um, something exciting that we should really watch for. You know, the sort of the essence of CLS can be demonstrated by mental exercises that change our physiology, our catechols, our heart rate, color word testing, or even doing mental arithmetic. So one fun thing we can do quickly is a color word test. And to do a color word test, you just put your hand on your pulse and you get a sense of your resting heart rate. And then I'll show you a couple of slides really quickly. And what you have to do is tell me, right in the middle of the screen, what color you see. So just feel your pulse, get a sense. And when you're ready, I'll start to show you. So just yell out, yell out what color you see. Okay. So it's stressful, right? I mean, you hear, you hear the word, which is not what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to say the color, not what the word said. So people reading the word, people looking for the color. When you realize it's the color, not the word, then you're, you know, it's stressful. 
and so our heart rates do go up, and you can detect that. And that's normal physiology. Neither the minute ventilator or the accelerometer is going to feel that, but to reproduce normal physiology in people, these are the sorts of responses that we'd like devices to be able to, to accommodate. So these things have been tested, of course. So here we have um, a VVI CLS programmer. So the CLS algorithm is wrong. That person is at rest, and there's their heart rate not moving. Then they do the color word test, and you see them having variation in their heart rate. And then they do the arithmetic challenge, and with mental math, the heart rate's accelerated and fluctuating. And then the test is over. Then you reprogram that individual, same individual, to a VVIR mode, which all of the biotronic devices can provide for you. They all have accelerometers. And then the rest period, the color word test, the mental arithmetic, the heart rate is static. And that's unfortunate, because probably those people would want some heart rate variability with those activities as we experienced and as um, study patients have been shown to, shown to have. So just some basic engineering concepts, and really it's the extent of my own understanding, but it kind of works like this. You have a lead in your ventricle, for example, and the heart's contracting around that lead. So you'll have changes in the volume of the blood pool surrounding the lead tip and that will result, if it's measuring it constantly, changes in the impedance that can be measured surrounding that lead tip throughout the contraction cycle. So when the heart is relaxed, there's a large blood pool around the lead, impedance is low as it contracts, the muscle um, density surrounding the lead tip increases, the impedance is high, and we measure that, and we can use changes in that impedance profile to judge appropriateness in heart rate, and that's the contractility-based sensor. So we've shown that changes in contractility indeed correlate linearly to changes in impedance, giving us a basis for believing this might work. And then during a cardiac cycle, the first 300 seconds of your cardiac cycle when the heart is really doing its contraction, um, the lead will sense your impedance every eight milliseconds and develop this resting impedance profile during that initial portion of your cardiac cycle. So while you're at rest, the device knows you're at rest because the accelerometer says you're not moving, it builds your resting template. And then from your resting template, it is going to compare how that template changes as you exert yourself. So you have your patient on the table, you implant the device in the first 10 minutes while you're closing the pocket. It is collecting its rapid resting waveform, and it's gonna roll that average over one week of activity, activity and as weeks and months go by, it's gonna to continue to update that resting profile as that patient changes. They become more conditioned, less conditioned. The resting profile changes. The device is always gonna know. And of course it knows because the accelerometer tells us when that person is at rest. So you get this beautiful and relevant and current resting impedance profile. And from that, as the person exerts themselves, the impedance will deviate from that resting profile. <coughs> and the degree of deviation from the resting profile tells the, pace, the pacemaker how much faster to pace the individual. Turns out this is very sensitive, can change with one or two beats dramatically, and um, can really give very appropriate heart rate distributions. Then the pacemaker says, okay, we're gonna give you an exertional threshold rate on average, which is based on your age and disposition, We'll say 80% of the time you're probably going to be at rest, 20% of the time you're going to have activity, and we'll distribute the range of heart rates on the CLS profile based on lower rate limit, upper rate limit that you've chosen, based on the ETR that we have calculated for you, and this is how we're going to distribute your heart rates in response to your impedance changes. That's sort of the intuition. So we have these different impedance curves, and I can scale the degree of CLS. I can say, you know, honestly, for 99% of my people, nominal is exactly what they need. You just out of the box, turn it on, and it will figure out a beautiful heart rate profile for those individuals. But for those people where it isn't quite sensitive or too sensitive, you can scale the CLS response. So don't think you, you, you have no control over it. And that's interesting because I had, you know, lunch at Heart Rhythm with one of my EP faculty from Columbia University, who's still on faculty, and he didn't know you could scale CLS, for example, and he was scared of it because he thought you could scale it. You can scale it. You haven't, you know, you haven't completely lost control of the device. Um, so some of the programming features are here. 
Um, you know, hysteresis for AV delays can be adjusted and, and can be dynamic. CLS response is programmable. You have this um, resting rate control, which we will disable in those cases of neurocardiogenic syncope. But that's the device giving itself a safety check saying, how much should I change your heart rate in response to a sudden change in impedance? So nominally, that's 20 beats a minute. You know, probably a sudden change minute to minute, we shouldn't change you by 80 or 90 beats a minute, so we'll make it 20. You can program that, but be aware the nominal setting is 20. In the setting of neurocardiogenic syncope, you want to disable that, and we'll see that a sudden change in contractility can be the initiating event of the vasovagal episode, which can result in your patient on the floor. So you want a higher level of sensitivity should that be occurring in the appropriate patient, such as the one we implanted yesterday. That device, we, that feature, with, um, we disable that implant, and I'll show you how that works. So best uses of CLS, again, chronotropic incompetence, neurocardiogenic syncope. Maybe I'm going backwards here. Some clinical examples. So this is classically what a neurocardiogenic event looks like. Um, we have blood pressure dropping in response to the vasovagal episode at a time when heart rate should be increasing as blood, as blood vessels dilate and as the blood rushes to your extremities or you know drains from your head and you're going to get faint. Your heart rate should be increasing to keep those vessels full, but part of the pathology is that the heart rate is in fact um, decelerating and as a result the person falls and then your system recovers and compensates and adjusts itself, but your patient's already hit the ground and perhaps has cracked their head or broken their hip or, or things of this nature. So we want to interrupt that. And this is how that can look in even an 18-year-old girl with neurocardiogenic syncope where she's on a tilt and then that event begins to occur and we see blood pressure drop at the same time heart rate is pathologically dropping. Cardiac output also decreases there's the fainting episode before we kick out of that pathologic cycle and recover to normal. So this is the sort of physiology that we're trying to interrupt with um, the appropriate pacing system. So here we have that sequence of events where the first event is blood vessels dilate. In response to blood vessels dilating, your body first overcompensates with a very vigorous contraction of your heart. Very vigorous and then you overcompensate to the, for that because everything's out of balance by slowing heart rate. So your body says blood vessels dilating, increase contractility, then your body says contractility way up, slow heart rate because cardiac output's too high, and then as blood vessels are dilating, heart rate is dropping and patient falls. So we're trying to abort this. Um, and that's due to the imbalance of parasympathetic, sympathetic tone, hypotension and bradycardia, in a DDDR system, it's only going to start to increase the pacing rate when it sees that pathologic drop in heart rate, but that could be too late and the patient's already on the ground. In the CLS system, programmed appropriately, that vigorous contraction is anticipated. We begin to pace faster early that it's able to stabilize blood pressure by filling dilated vessels in time that that malignant vasovagal syncope event need not occur. So now our patient has not fallen and um, our pacemaker has served them well. So here is an interesting example of that in a 26 year old with history of blackouts. They're implanted with a CLS pacemaker and here they are over the first seven days of their device in a system where they are both paced and sensed and we see this very nice range of heart rates in that individual at a time when their activity level is still very low. So only 2% of time are they active, but even with that low level of activity, which the accelerometer would struggle with, a very nice, well-rounded heart rate distribution profile as a result of the CLS algorithm. So improving that person and not allowing them to faint. Again, the resting rate control option, nominally set at 20, in the person with true vasovagal syncope, we want to disable this or increase it to a higher number so that you'll have a, a much greater heart rate increase than 20 beats a minute, enough to abort the, um, the pathologic fall. So I'll show you a few examples of this. That's enough theory. And um, I, do, I do think these examples are a little bit curious. 
So here we have a 72-year-old man with ischemic cardiomyopathy as post-op flutter. We ablated him for flutter. Now he's in sinus rhythm. Ambulatory monitoring shows a profound bradycardia. So we treat him with a CLS pacemaker. So there's flutter, ablated to sinus rhythm. There is his heart rate distribution over seven days in the real world setting where he's spending 73% of his time less than 60 beats a minute. So he's really going slow. Most of his time is 40 to 50. Again, no dangerous bradycardia here. It's not dangerous. He's not passing out. He's not, you know, but this is um, slow and he feels um, symptomatic and sluggish and we can appropriately attribute that to heart rate. So he gets a dual chamber CLS pacemaker. So it's going to sense the contraction amp dynamics off of the ventricular channel and deliver CLS pacing through the atrial channel. And we think that should work best because contraction dynamics in the ventricle are bigger. So you'd expect the CLS algorithm to be brisk where the contraction dynamics are um, vigorous. So he comes down on post-operative day one. Here he is atrially pacing at 60 beats a minute compared to his ambulatory monitor Overnight, he is quite flat, but does have some rate variability, more than what his sensor would anticipate he should have. And then over the next 169 days, he develops these nicely rounded heart rate histograms, where his greatest percent pacing is not at his lower rate limit, more at an ADL limit, which I interpret as more appropriate and that's with a 55% atrial pacing, 11% activity with a sensor that would otherwise look like this. So a nice range of heart rates um, for chronotropic incompetency in this patient achieved probably in a way that's more elegant than what would be achieved by a sensor. I don't think the sensor would necessarily always look quite this flat, but um, I love the fact that his biggest pacing spike is not at his lower rate limit. And um, that to me looks like a very um, physiologic distribution of heart rates. When it came out, it was a big deal because when Biotronic's first MRI indicated um, a single chamber pacemaker um, gained FDA approval, it was the first single chamber pacemaker to be approved for MRI in the United States. And a little bit by luck and a little bit by good hustle from our local Biotronic team, we got that device and the appropriate patient arrived and we implanted the first one in the United States. So the first MRI compatible pacemaker in the United States um, was done in our lab. So that was an interesting result. The question here is still is that the best pacemaker and appropriate and for who? And I still think it provides a very unique opportunity in patients indicated for CLS. And it's interesting that we've done atrial-only pacemakers for chronotropic incompetence in certain individuals. Finding that contractility dynamics in the atria are perfectly brisk and can provide you with a heart rate distribution profile that looks like contractility um, arising from the ventricle. So here's an example of that 71-year-old non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, low EF, he had a flutter, we ablated the flutter, EF recovered, a lot of sinus bradycardia, profound on 12-day monitor, um, got the atrial-only pacemaker, we had no evidence of AV nodal pathology. So again, the flutter, the ablation, the sinus rhythm, the profoundly low heart rate, 65%, less than 50 beats a minute. We implant the atrial-only pacemaker, all he has is the atrial lead and he moves from this heart rate distribution to this heart rate distribution to this heart rate distribution all at a time when his activity levels are relatively constant, slightly improving. So here achieving this very nice physiologic range of rates with, with, with an atrial only system. So it's able to sense contractility dynamics, develop the appropriate templates, provide that pacing range of rates based on activity solely in the atria. And that's important because a large population wants only atrial-only pacemakers. And where I'm going at the end of this, um, we're going to need probably low contraction um, dynamics as well to provide appropriate um, to provide appropriate CLS. Here's another one: um, recurrent syncope. 26-year-old girl came into our hospital. Has bluish hands, lips. When her pulse rate goes low, she's suspected this for years. Her heart's completely normal. Hospital telemetry is 40 to 50. Um, 
bit of a leap of faith, but we went for the atrial-only pacemaker, atrial-only in a young girl because you want to minimize hardware in anyone who's young. I think we all appreciate that. And then we went through programming iterations, um, comparing all of these things, and found for her that there was optimal performance in point of fact with um, the CLS algorithm. So this is what look, that looked like. Here she is prior to her pacemaker in hospital with these symptoms um, with truly profoundly slow heart rates. There she is with her atrial only pacemaker. And then what happens? She comes out atrially pacing. Um, in the first zero to 14 days, uh, it was interesting. We started her with, um, I just want to see her programming here. We started her with conventional programming, AAIR, you know, um, 50, with, a net, with 60 with a night rate to 50. And there is the range of atrial pacing she developed with atrial pacing at 30% and um, most of her pacing at the lower rate limit. And voila, sometimes it works. This completely resolves her clinical symptoms. You give this girl a lower rate limit, she no longer feels faint, she's no longer feeling blue. You're like, we have cured you, you are fine. Um, you're, you're appropriately happy. So we said, you know what? Um, rate response isn't doing much for you anyway. Why don't we disable rate response and um, just go to AAI programming? Profile looks very similar. Now her atrial pacing burden is down to 15% and she feels equivocal. You're like, okay, you didn't even need rate responsive programming. We said, you know what, your pacemaker has this feature, would you like to try it, where we do the CLS rate responsiveness. So we program her with that, nominal settings. She walks out the clinic door, runs back in, turn it off, I can't stand this, my heart's jumping out of my chest. So nominal for her was too aggressive. We couldn't convince her to just let it adapt. So we, we set it to very low because you can scale this, remember. So we set it to very low and she goes out at very low and now her profile goes on to look like this. Atrially pacing 53% now at a time she's not a really um, pretty active gal, you know, more active than before. And she decides clinically that this is the most appropriate profile for her. She goes, this I'm happy with, most happy with, and my symptoms are in fact even better. So even at times when we think we've solved someone's clinical problem, and it seems that that's the case, there is the chance that we could do still better, and there's the chance that, um, that CLS could offer us you know, that opportunity. Another example of atrial only for chronotropic incompetence, this is kind of a, kind of a favorite story. 53-year-old man, very fit, healthy, professional, um, says he's always since childhood underperformed athletically. Very fit and healthy. You wouldn't know that to look at him. He said that was the case, kind of met him socially, um, found out I was a cardiologist. He said, oh, I have a PFO and I'm going for closure of my PFO. And by the way, I've always, you know, felt sluggish and unwell, and I'm wondering if this is the answer and if this is going to change everything. Like, great, well, good luck, you know, met him for the first time. So he goes, he gets closure of his PFO here in 2014, and um, then sort of six months later, I saw him at a social event and said, hey, you know, since your PFO closure, how are you feeling? No change, don't feel any different. Makes the comment that my heart rate's always slow. Heart rate's always slow. You know, didn't want to talk about it, we're at an event. Um, so thinking about that later on, called him back and said, hey, would you like a monitor? You want to investigate that slow heart rate thing? And uh, so he agreed to that. So we um, did our monitor, found it to be quite chronotropically incompetent, gave him the pacemaker then um, in December of 2014, and really did um, have a very important response for him. So here he is on his office ECG, sinus 44, post amplats closure, five-day monitor. Um, here's his heart rate distribution. You know, 70, 80 percent of the time he's less than 60 beats a minute. 22 percent of the time he's less than 40 beats a minute. This looks very sluggish, and could address. So we implanted him with the atrial only pacemaker, subpec. There is his little Amplatz closure device. You recognize it on the x-ray once you've seen it on fluoroscopy. So it is, it is present there. There's his incision. Post-op day one, atrially pacing at 52%. And then his range of heart rate histograms as time progresses. So this was his four and a half days of monitoring. 
overnight on the first day, programmed CLS 50 to 150. We thought he's young and healthy. He should have a nice range of heart rates. Doesn't pace much while he's laying there in bed and quite a bit of pain from the sub-pec. Um, zero to six days, you see it in this range of heart rates, actually pacing at 89. Had some problem with the device seeming to overcompensate for him, so we scaled back to a 60 to one, a 50 to 140 heart rate. And over the next 87 days, he looks like this. Decided he'd like to try the 150 again, and we went ahead with the um, 150. And for the next 50 beats, for the next 60 days, his heart rates take on this profile. As his activity level varies from high to low, you wonder what he's doing in these different amounts of time, but it is a certain amount of variability. And despite the variability, his, um, you know, his heart rate profiles tend to look similar. And we do this with the rate responsive programmers all the time. We look at the histogram and we say, oh, you're not moving as much since last time. And the patient's like, you're right, I'm not moving as much. But if you think about it, Physiologically, if someone's not moving as much, their heart rate should go faster as they get deconditioned, you know, sort of lose the athletic response. So the physiologic thing is, is your heart rate, as your activity level goes down, you become deconditioned, your heart rate actually picks up to compensate for that. And we sort of see that in the CLS programmers. As, you're, you know, as your activity levels vary, your range of heart rates tend not to change um, nearly as much. So he proved um, his benefit from the CLS pacing with his own exercise monitors. He was delighted to see sort of these patterns of his activity density as he would exercise um, for up to an hour. He started to send me um, text messages post op day four. Several times I felt like my heart was racing, checked the app, which is on his iPhone. Sure enough, it was racing. Uh, I charged up the stairs in our house and the feeling of more rapid heart rate is unfamiliar to me. I could certainly tell the difference in the energy level when I got to the top. Very exciting to feel a pacemaker work. Thank you. Um, Post-op day seven, feeling really, really good. Mind is very clear, very focused. Energy levels are really great. Um, Post-op day 13, very familiar with me last night. Intense sex, first time, completely different world. And this is edited, no sudden drop in energy. Felt like my heart was supporting, keep going and going. And yeah, great. You know, so that was interesting. So now it's really, he's really, um, really engaged. Six months, um, high at, we had increased to 150. The 150 is now perfect for me. Lots of cardio in my workout. I see the 150 all the time. 22, bike, 22 mile bike ride felt fantastic. Uh, so he's really uh, enthusiastic about that. We have increased his lower rate limit now to 160 from 150 at his request. And he's giving me these workout reports where, bam, he will hit over the course of an hour of exercise. He will hit that upper rate limit of 160 and kind of stay there. And honestly, I felt very comfortable and I was not out of breath until I climbed a huge hill on his um, bicycle machine here. So very happy. So heart rate's important to people, and these adjustments we make, these adjustments we make are important, and physiologic pacing is critical to the right individual. Even if they sort of feel better, and that was a big improvement, they can do even better when um, heart rate is in fact um, just perfect for those, for those particular individuals. Um, here is one final case, and I, I promise you it's, our, it's our, almost our last on this, 32-year-old gal She's had five ablations for inappropriate sinus tachycardia performed elsewhere on her AV node in the setting of hyperthyroid, her last at age 27. She had a pacemaker put in, then it was taken out. She had syncope after the pacemaker was taken out. Ejection fractions always preserved. Thyroidectomy finally in July of 2014. Her tachycardia resolves. Now she's feeling <coughs> profound bradycardic episodes without the hyperthyroidism and with all that shelling of her sinus node. Um, wondering what to do, we gave her a seven-day ambulatory monitoring. Monitor no concerning bradycardia, but lots of sinus node exit block, which was very concerning to her and sure, certainly not physiologic. And for her, again, young age, the atrial-only pacemaker, really resolving her clinical dilemma. So she comes into her office, here's the ECG, doesn't look like she needs a pacemaker. You give her the seven-day monitor, there's kind of this plateau in heart rates, which in point of fact, correspond to this very irregular activity. So where you see is P waves fail, sinus node exit block, until P waves engage again, then more sinus node exit block until the P waves engage. 
and that's that stuttering heart rate, which is not physiologic and very concerning to her. Remember, she's passed out. She's wondering if it's going to fail, hoping she won't pass out again, and someone who's very fit and interested and concerned about her health. So she gets the atrial-only pacemaker. Again, young person doesn't want heavy hardware. We don't want it. We want to avoid hardware in these individuals. Uh, she took the subpectoral implant as well as she's um, very vigorous in her activities. And um, here she goes. So that's her seven day monitor, day zero to six, 34 days, 76. And our last big stretch was 459 days. Very similar profiles, atrial pacing always in the high 40% range, despite activity levels, which are considerably different <coughs> over large periods. 76 days with 6% activity, then larger intervals with twice as much activity, very similar heart rate profiles as that device adjusts to, in fact, the contractility, not her motion, and gives her the heart rate that is probably most appropriate for her and um, something that she is just very happy with and couldn't imagine life um, any differently. We said new this year is CRT with CLS, and we've had opportunity to do that. This is, again, a Yakima patient, 76-year-old man, remote history of by bypass, complicated by an embolic CVA, residual right-sided deficits, expressive aphasia. He's a required retired vet, still enjoys a very high quality of life despite some of these problems. He had a biotronic dual-chamber ICD implanted in 2008 when his EF was 35, Failed endovascular LV lead placement, so it was attempted. 100% ventricular pacing. His generator got changed three years ago. No epicardial lead placed. Now he's back in our emergency department in heart failure. EF is down to 20 to 25%. 100% ventricular pacing throughout. And you're talking to a perfectly intelligent man who enjoys his life and wants to continue living. So what's the appropriate thing to do? Give him an LV lead. So we had the surgeons place that, given the history of prior failure, reprogram him DDDR to DDD CLS with CRT. So this is our first experience with um, the CRT device. So here he is, one month pre-op, and then post-op with this epicardial system. This is now the biotronic device with CLS. This is the old biotronic device, which did not have CLS because it's brand new. We do this ECG optimization protocol and identified that LV offset zero gave him the most favorable QRS morphology. So wonderful, that's the one we would have picked anyway, and it's the one that continues to allow him CLS pacing, because it um, right now constrains you to an LV offset of zero. So beautiful. We send him out, and I tried to compare his rates. So this is 236 days pre-op with his DDDR device and you see these histograms, and then with DDD CLS, same range of rates, nominal settings, first 26 days, 100% ventricular pacing in both, and you see this heart rate, these heart rate peaks are um, a little bit higher. So he's selecting some faster heart rates in the 80 to 89 beat per minute range with um, the CLS algorithm, and he's moved off of his lower rate limit with CLS compared to not. Hard to compare because this is somebody who's essentially wheelchair bound. He's an immediate responder to, to CRT, so he's feeling better from the resynchronization. So he's probably getting a little bit more animated anyway from that. So it's tough to compare, but on close date, um, you know, very um, close in the preoperative, postoperative period, it was it, interesting to see how CLS was picking those heart rates for this individual who is really uh, quite wheelchair bound and um, due to his um, prior stroke. So very interesting that it's choosing even faster heart rates for him, and I think even slightly more physiologic profile than the um, rate responsive programming that he had previously. So we'll continue to, continue to see how he evolves. So again, we've seen improvements over this, and I showed this at the start, sort of that classic sensor-based rate histogram. We see rate histograms that are pretty normal, with the rate responsive pacemaker. So it's not like they don't work, but we do see this at times in individuals who are otherwise quite animated, enjoying a quality of life and doing a certain amount of activities. And I always think that this is unfortunate because this is not physiologic and they could probably do better with the CLS system. This is in many of our ICD patients and now we have that opportunity for them, potentially a generator change to consider a CLS system, give them the opportunity to 
alter this heart rate histogram for the first time. A new area in pacing, which I'm dying to see how CLS responds, his bundle pacing. This is a hot issue at CLS. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, heart rhythm. Lots of presentations on this, new publications. Looks very promising, implant techniques are hot. Right now, only Medtronic has the sheet that allows you to position a lead in the his position. So in some of our patients going for AVJ ablation for um, um, hopelessly uncontrolled atrial fibrillation, we have opted to try the his bundle pacing, goal, maximal physiologic pacing, you know, preserve the ejection fraction of these patients who will go on to be pacer dependent. I'd love to see how CLS responds with its pacing lead in the his position. Or would Biotronic need to take the CLS algorithm off the atria, because we know it works well there, and apply it to the heart rates delivered to the his system in patients with this configuration of pacing. So it's an interesting challenge moving forward as I think this does become the next hot topic in pacing to see if we can apply CLS in that scenario. And the challenge really is the sheath. It's all about the sheath that allows you to put the lead in the his position. And that's a plastic sheath. It's not like a technological marvel or revolution. You know, it's just one company has it and they're in short supply right now. And um, it's an easy adjustment. And we've had the thought already to extend um, the pacing algorithm um, to that scenario as well. So future opportunities, can we really study CLS with atrial only pacemaking? Is there any important differences with the ventricle? Because we don't know. We'd love to see any LV offset in the CRT systems with CLS. And finally, in the setting of permanent his bundle pacing, can we have a CLS system in that scenario?